<clears throat> Jeff Baranoff. Ivory's goons may be able to kidnap me, rough me up, and hold me in this chair, but they can't force me to look at their boss and her magic pen. Because what's her? what is Ivory doing? Trying to hypnotize him. I squirm in the seat, squeezing my eyes shut and trying to tune out that melodic voice telling me how relaxed I am. I'm not relaxed. I'm pretty much the polar opposite of relaxed. I'm freaked out. I'm scared to death. And mostly, I'm furious at this liar, this crook who brainwashes people and calls it meditation. This is a safe place. Ivory goes on silkily. A comfortable place. You want to be here. You're among friends. I keep my lids pressed together. How about the hundreds of alligators out back? Are they friends too? Ivory doesn't miss a beat. If only you'd open your eyes. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I spit at her. Then you could brainwash me the way you brainwashed everybody else. A barren off writing you checks how many alligators would that buy? Although my eyes are still shut, I detect a slight shift in Ivory's tone. It's still rich and smooth, but her meditation voice is gone. Now she's more conversational. You're a pretty smart kid, Jet. I should have expected that, considering who your father is. Not even Magnus ever came close to finding out about my little secret life. What part, I demand, opening my eyes to glare at her. The big house, the fancy car, the alligator farm you pay for with other people's money, or maybe you just like being called Snapper. Very easy for you to say, Ivory replies bitterly, when your bank account was bursting before you were even born. You may disapprove of my methods, but the end result is the same for both of us. We have... But I didn't brainwash anybody to get it. Ha, that. Ivy looks pensive. It brings up a problem of what I'm going to do with you. An intelligent boy like you must surely see that I can't release you until I've had a chance to change your attitude. She holds up the pen and flicks up on the light. You understand. You have no choice. I close my eyes again, but for the first time, I actually see it from Ivory's point of view. If she lets me go, what I know could send her to prison for lots of years. So, believe it or not, my only way out of this pickle is to let her brainwash me. My fevered mind races, struggling to come up with another way out, but there just isn't one. Sometimes, Vlad always says, there's nothing you can do but pray for a miracle. Sorry, Dad. Miracles are for people like you, a guy whose little computer shop grew into a global tech empire. I'm not you, not smart enough, definitely not lucky. I grit my teeth and get ready to open my eyes and let Ivory do her worst. Here goes nothing. And then the outside world lights up like the new high noon. And an earth-shaking kaboom jolts the house on its foundation, shattering glass all around us. Ivory and the goons wheel to face the source of the blast. Free at last, I leap to my feet in time to see a tremendous eruption of light and color through the empty space that used to be the picture window. It's like the entire 4th of July compressed into a few dazzling seconds with Roman candles spitting projectiles of flame in all directions, including into the house. Fireworks. My fireworks. What set them off? A curious chipmunk. No time to worry about that now. I turn on my heel and sprint for the front hall. One of the goons runs after me just as he reaches out and spins me around. A big skyrocket comes screaming in through the broken window and rams into the ceiling, raining plaster on both of us. With a loud bang, it goes off, filling the room with thick smoke. Suddenly, my pursuer is dancing frantically, slapping at the red, white, and blue sparks that cover him from head to toe. I leave him in my dust, pounding for the exit. A split second before I get there, the front door is flung wide, missing me by about half an inch. Grace and Tyrell have to put on the brakes to avoid flattening me. What are you doing here? I blurt. Rescuing you, stupid! Grace shoots back, the det detonator still clutched in her hand. Let's go! Rasp Tyrell, leading the charge out the door and along the driveway. I follow, but over my so shoulder, I can see Ivory and the goons coming out of the house, waving the smoke from their eyes. Beyond them, I catch a glimpse of the saline river. A stray rocket sails over the water, casting a pink glow over a boiling wave of escaping alligators. In spite of everything, I feel like cheering. I didn't blow the gate, but the gate blew, and that's the main thing. We're running our hardest, but the adults have longer legs than we do, and the gap is closing. Where are we going, I call. Surely they're not planning to hoof it all the way back to the oasis. Tyrell points. There, straight ahead, half hidden in some tall grass, is one of the oasis golf carts. 
At this point, I wouldn't trade it for Ivory's Ferrari and every Bentley in Silicon Valley. We jump aboard, me in the driver's seat. Hurry, Tyrell wheezes. They're almost here. Even as I start off the steer and steer out of the weeds, I know we're too late. They're all over us. I stomp on the accelerator and have the satisfaction of running over a goon's toe. I jam my foot hard on the pedal, but the wheels just spin. Ivory and the other goons are locked onto the sunshade, holding us in place. Two more goons come racing onto the scene, hemming us in. We're caught. When I see the rage in Ivory's face, my fear level bumps up to an 11. The house is busted up. The alligators are gone. This is not going to go well. Brooklyn Feldman. I shudder awake to urgent voices inside our cottage, my dad and one other person. I sit up in bed and strain to eavesdrop. I looked in on him and he isn't there. The visitor is out of breath. I've been all over the oasis. He isn't anywhere. It's Matt, which means he's talking about Jet. I think back to the last words I heard him say. If you won't help me do the right thing, I'll do it myself. I throw him out of my sweatshirt and run into, out into the living room where my father is trying to calm Matt down. I think I know where Jet might have gone, I exclaim. Where, they chorus. To Hedge Apple. There's a giant mansion on the river just outside town. Dad stares at me. How could he get all the way over there? But Matt doesn't need convincing. Don't even ask. I believe it 100%. This is Jet. If there's any trouble around, he'll find it. My father is still skeptical. Why would Jet even know about this mansion? I don't mean to doubt you, Matt, but I hesitate to send police on a wild goose chase when the boy might just be out for a midnight stroll. I choose my words carefully. I don't want to get myself in trouble in case the history of Jet's visits to Hedge Apple comes up. Jet's obsessed with the place. He thinks there's a secret alligator farm there, and he thinks... I hesitate. I don't want to bring poor Ivory into all this. A gangster named Snapper is in charge of it all. They gawk at me. I add weakly. I could be wrong. Jet's probably okay. At that moment, a flash from outside lights up the dim living room. A few seconds later, a muffled explosion rattles the cottage. Distant, but not too distant. We run to the window. To the north of the oasis, the sky glows, illuminating a rising plume of smoke. Oh, gosh. Jet blew up the mansion. I blurt. Or himself, Matt adds in horror. We need the police. My father pulls a key ring from a kitchen cabinet and heads for the door. I'm going to the welcome center to get a phone. Matt is aghast. You don't have one here? I live by the same rules I set for my guests, Dad replies righteously. I run into my room, grab the phone that I hide between the mattress and the box spring, and give it to my father. He's stunned. But you surrendered your phone when you got here. I surrendered a phone, I confess. I've been coming here since I was six. I've learned to be, be a bit... be a, I've learned to bring a spare. I'm probably going to hear about this later, but finding Jet is of top priority right now. Dad punches in 911, and between the three of us, we manage to stammer out the story of the missing kid and the explosion. The dispatcher tells us they've already gotten calls about the blast, and the officers are on their way to check it out. Dad and I throw on clothes, and together, Matt, together with Matt, we run for the Range Rover. It's the first time I've seen my father behind the wheel of a car since I was six. In his life as the Oasis, there always a buddy available to be the chauffeur. I don't remember him as a crazy driver, but we're burning rubber and shattering speed limits. I guess dad is more worried about Jet than he lets on. By car, the trip to Hedge Apple is only a few minutes long, compared with the 20-minute chug on the river. As we approach the road that leads to the mansion, three Arkansas State Police cars speed out in front of us, flashing, flashers Idaho. whirling. Arkansas. Uh, no, I thought it was Idaho. Idaho. Arkansas. Dad guns the accelerator, and we hit the dirt road flying. As we close in on the big house, the headlights of the sleep squad car illuminate a frightening scene. In the weeds off the main driveway, Jet, Grace, and Tyrell are being dragged out of a golf cart by several large men. The cops blurp their sirens, and the shocked attackers flee in the direction of the mansion. State troopers burst out of the cruisers, chase down the fugitives, fugitives and take them into custody. My father... <clears throat> hiccups. My father slams on the brake and the three of us hit the ground running. Matt never struck me as the athletic type, but he covers the distance to Jet in Olympic sprinter time. Grace and Tyrell hunch nearby, their hands on their knees, panting. The three of them are shaken up, but don't seem hurt. My attention shifts to the arrest taking place beyond us. My eyes jump from face to face. Four large, muscular men and Ivory? Dad breathes in astonishment. I've expect, I'm expect, I'm every bit as stunned as he is. I knew Jet suspected Ivory. I managed, I never told you because in a million years, I didn't believe it could be true. 
We watch as this trooper slaps handcuffs on the Oasis's number two. The six foot four Ivory receives no gentler treatment than her employees. As she struggles against the tight shackles, her expression bears no resemblance to the usual serene smile of the center's medita meditation pathfinder. The cop is no shrimp himself, but he has to wrestle Ivory all the way to the squad car. Base, you need to call Game and Fish, he says into his walkie-talkie. We got upwards of 300 alligators released in the Saline River. You heard me, alligators. Like, see you later, alligator. For me, that's the crowning glory. Jet was right about that, too. That was the truth? I asked Jet, who has finally managed to wiggle his way out of Matt's bear hug. Grace nods solemnly. We owe Jet a huge apology. We didn't believe him when he was the only one who knew anything. I'm the one who owes you guys everything, Jet says fervently. You probably saved my life tonight. The trooper has Ivory almost to the car when my father steps forward and faces his meditation pathfinder. For an electric moment, the two square off. I'm holding my breath. What will Marvin Feldman, a.k.a. Magnus Fellini, say to his second in command who betrayed him so completely? My dad places a hand on the shoulder of Ivory's gown and says sincerely, be whole, Ivory. <laughs> Fool! No. Ivory's eyes bulge. You think I like your terrible food and your dime store philosophy? My one consolation going to prison is I no longer have to pretend that you have something to offer any living creature with an IQ greater than a pineapple. Jet springs forward, his face flaming red. Hey, lay off Nimbus. Can't you see he's trying to be cool about this even though you stabbed him in the back? Okay, so maybe his food stinks and his philosophy isn't for everybody. He believes in what he does and there's nothing phony about him, unlike you. He is a better person than you'll ever be. Ivory seems genuinely bewildered. Who's Nimbus? The trooper locks her in the back of the squad car so she never gets an answer. My father turns to Jet. Thank you. That was very affirming. Now... Let's get back to the Oasis. It's late, and we've all had a busy night. As we pile into the Range Rover, a smile tugs at Dad's lips. <laughs> Nimbus, he murmurs. <laughs> Jet Baranoff. I have a dream. Vlad reads about the explosion in Hedge Apple and jumps on the Gulf Stream. Next thing I know, a chopper is landing right in the middle of the Oasis, blowing the steam off the surface of the bath. Out jumps my father, sick with worry. I've come to take you home, son, he says emotionally. Forget the San Francisco airport. Your safety and happiness are all that matter to me. Man, do I ever dream big. The reality is pretty different. The news from Arkansas never reaches Silicon Valley. Or if it does, Vlad doesn't hear because he's too distracted negotiating to expand Fuego to Antarctica or maybe even Pluto. Matt tries to smooth things over. Well, you have to understand, your dad's a pretty busy guy. He probably wouldn't pay attention to a local news story from all the way across the country. Typical Matt, always covering for the boss. Still, he's grateful to me for exposing Ivory's scam, which saved him and a lot of other people a ton of money. He even grudgingly admits that the same attitude that made me Silicon Valley's number one spoiled brat may have helped me take down Snapper with everybody else thought I was nuts. Not that being a brat means you should get a medal, but stepping up to do what's right is a good thing, even if it's a brat who's doing it. First thing in the morning after that crazy night, Nimbus gets the adult together, adults together and explains what Ivory has been doing. He returns the checks from the leather pouch and promises to work with the police to pay back all the donations from the past years. The money from selling the mega mansion, the Ferrari, and Ivory's other assets will go toward that. Except one, the 300-plus alligators, are halfway to Louisiana by now. Arkansas Game and Fish is happy to report that the animals are mostly sticking to the river, heading south for the warmer water that's their natural habitat. Nimbus also offers anybody who wants to leave a full refund. Not a single guest takes him up on it. Go figure. I thought the adults would stop loving the Oasis now that Ivory isn't brainwashing them anymore, but that hasn't happened, which totally blows me away. Take Matt, for instance. He totally gets what happened to him in meditation, but he hasn't made him any less gung-ho about the place. He claims he's never felt stronger or more energetic. He's going to keep being a vegetarian even after he leaves. Also, his aches and pains have totally disappeared. All the old people say the aches and pains part. I guess Matt's getting pretty old. He'll be 30 in less than three years. <laughs> he's so old. 
I bet you'll feel better too. He says, he tells me, you're just too stubborn to admit it. I guess not being brainwashed anymore hasn't made you any smarter. I reply, if Nimbus had offered me the chance to dip, this whole place would be bur buried under a coat of my dust. I can't resist adding, like you won't be happy to get back to Fuego so you can take your rightful place ruling the world. He gives me an odd smile. I'm not going back to Fuego. My letter of recognition is already on its way to your father. I stare at him. You're quitting? Why? I know you don't get paid much now, but if you stick with Vlad, eventually you'll be rich. Magnus once faced the same crossroads. He explains, explains serenely. He was doing well on Wall Street, but he realized that what he really wanted was to make a difference in people's lives. I'm horrified. You're not going to open another oasis, are you? Because let me tell you, one is bad enough. I, Of course not. There can only be one Magnus. He looks me in the eye. I'm going to be a teacher. A computer teacher? I'm going to teach English to kids in the developing world. Orthodontists Without Borders is opening a string of schools attached to their clinics. How's that for a coincidence? My first boss was your father, and my next one is going to be your mom. I'm blown away. Are you sure you're not making a huge mistake? Mistake? There are no mistakes, only the twists and turns in the road of life, he chuckles. That's what Magnus says anyway. This feels right. Silicon Valley was never a good fit for me. Because Vlad stuck you with me, I finished ruefully. No way. How do you think I discovered I love working with kids? If I can handle Vladimir Baranoff's son, I'm ready to take on anything. I've never been the biggest fan, biggest Nimbus fan, and that's not going to change. But if the Oasis showed Matt how to be happy doing what he loves, then there must be something good about it. And he isn't even like, and it isn't even like I'll never see him again since he'll be working with mom. I can just picture the look on Vlad's face when I hit him up to go to Honduras or Rwanda for spring break to visit mom and Matt. That might be the sweetest fertilizer meat fan moment of all. I wouldn't even mind being sent back to the Oasis for a few days next year, provided Tyrell, Brooklyn, and Grace are going to be here. I'd never admit that to Matt, but this place isn't that terrible. This, the activities aren't really any more boring than what I'd be doing somewhere else, like a camp or a youth program at a country club. I've already started enjoying the bath in a what you doesn't kill you makes you stronger sort of way. Face it, nobody is ever going to make a jacuzzi that gets that hot for fear of being sued. So if you want to be boiled to the outer limits of human tolerance, it's the oasis or nothing. And if there's something a Silicon Valley spoiled brat can't resist, it's a one-of-a-kind experience. I still hate the food, but there are things that I hate less than others. So starving to death isn't going to happen. I've got friends ever since the explosion night, Tyrell, Brooklyn, and Grace, and I have been pretty tight. I even had a pet for a little while. He turned out to be a juvenile delinquent alligator, but it still counts. And anyway, I'm going back home in less than three weeks. I can do three weeks standing on my head. Tyrell and I are knee deep in water climbing down the pet pedal boat when the cry comes from fa farther down the beach. Hey, Amelia Azuma exclaims, there's a scary lizard over here. 10,000 volts of electricity couldn't be a bigger reaction for me. I leap from the boat, upending Tyrell and dropping him face first in the shallows. He sputters and calls my name, but I can't process anything. Every ounce of my focus is devoted to pounding across the shoreline to where Amelia stands over another pedal boat, shouting and brandishing a bulrush like a weapon. I follow her frightened gaze. About three inches of water have accumulated at the bottom of the fiber glass craft. A tiny reptile rests poised, 90% submerged, only his eyes and nostrils above the surface. He hovers there, watching and waiting. I rip the bulrush from Amelia's hand and fling it away. Are you crazy? I demand. You could have hurt Needle. The name brings Grace Brooklyn splashing over to me. Tyrell is hot in their heels, high-stepping in his drenched bathing suit. They take it as in the sight of our long-lost pet in his signature pose. Amelia is bewildered. What's in needles? Brooklyn puts a comforting arm around her shoulders. Go find another boat, Amelia. We've got this one under control. There's enough for Amelia. By now, everyone knows who Brooklyn's dad is. Hearing someone from her... Hearing, hearing something from her is like hearing it from Nimbus himself. The younger girl rushes off. I can't believe it's needles. I marvel. Naturally, Grace has to rain on my parade. You know, Jet, it looks like needles, but it could be any one of the baby alligators from the farm. They all washed right by here after the gate blew. It's needles, I say vehemently. Look how he look how he's standing. Tyrell frowns. Don't all alligators do that? So I reach out a finger. Needles chomps on it and holds on. I don't even notice the pain. See? Needles! It takes some doing, but I managed to pull my finger free. A few drops of blood hit the water. It's a privilege to lose blood to needles one more time. So what now? Brooklyn asks. 
I'm not losing him again, I reply readily. If I get a phone, if I can get to a phone, I'll order a terrarium for him. I'll keep him in that for three weeks and then bring him home with me. He's he'll love California. Jet, Grace says gently, he's an alligator. He's not going to fit in a terrarium forever. The day will come when a little bite won't draw a couple drops of blood. It'll take your arm off. You're forgetting who my dad is, I counter. He'll build needles a habitat with a pool and a waterfall, and we'll go to the San Diego Zoo and buy a lady alligator so he can raise a family. Needles and I are going to grow old together. You guys can come visit us. Flat has plenty of room. Nobody says a word, but we've gotten so close that I can read their minds. They think we should call Arkansas Game and Fish. We'll take Needles down south where the rest of the alligators went. He'll have a real habitat there, not a fake one. And he'd be with his family. Then again, my friends don't, didn't grow up with Vlad in a world where anything is possible if you throw enough money at it. Still, probably not even Vlad could afford to build a swamp as good as the real thing. And Needles might want to pick his own girlfriend. I definitely would. I sigh and say... Okay, let's contact Game and Fish. I can't resist adding, but Needles is going to miss me. Translation, I'll miss him. On the spot, I resolve to get a pet as soon as I'm back in California. I don't care about Vlad's expensive floors and personal services. I need this. It'll be kind of an awkward conversation when he asks why I named my hamster Needles, but tough. I'll just reply, you're the creator of Fuego. You tell me. And he won't be able to. He has no idea how having friends, human, and reptile changes everything about a guy's priorities. And how doing the right thing can be more important than doing what makes you happy, even when it hurts. My father is considered the smartest man in the world. But when it comes to the unplugged life, I'm the brains of this family.